When I was young, I wanted to compete. When I went blind, I wanted to go further. just wanted to walk again. Back in the summer of 2010, I fell from a third story window onto the concrete below. And I'm not exactly sure how it came about, but I suspect I got up to go to the bathroom. And as a blind person, I used to run my hand along the wall to find my way. That night, my hand found an open space where the closed window should have been, and I cartwheeled out. My friends who found me thought I was dead. The doctors in intensive care suspected I was going to die, and when I realized what had happened, I wondered whether dying might have been the best outcome. I'd fractured my skull, I had three bleeds on my brain, massive internal injuries, and a spine damaged in two places, leaving me with no feeling or movement from my waist down. All of that added to the blindness that had happened 12 years earlier. Now, I'm sure you can appreciate I didn't choose any of it. I didn't choose the accident, the injuries, the consequences. None of it was my choice. But by way of making sense of it, I've come to acknowledge that sometimes we have the luxury of choosing the challenges that we take on. <clears throat> and sometimes challenges choose us. What we decide to do about them, that's what counts, and it's often all that we can control. So I'm gonna to talk to you about two decision themes. Um, one is about whether we decide to be spectators or competitors. And the second is whether we decide to be soloists or collaborators. Now, I don't work in the hospitality industry, but you have to have some kind of expertise, I suppose, if you're asked to speak to an audience with a mic microphone. <coughs> and. Um, uh, my expertise is in acquiring disabilities, a particular endeavor <laughs> that I'm arguably world class at. <laughs> so that's what I've got to, you know, lift you into the middle part of the day. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to start with blindness before we move on to the inevitable slide into paralysis, which came some years later. Uh, I like to think of the blindness story as kind of the good old days. And, um, <laughs> That's in relation to this first decision, to be a, a spectator or a competitor when challenges appear. So back in 1998, I was a student in Trinity College in Dublin in Ireland studying for a business studies and economics degree. After graduation, I was gonna go and start a job in investment banking in London, may have ended up in New York, but more than a student or a wannabe investment banker, I was a a rower, I was rowing crew for the university and also for Ireland. So I knew exactly who I was and indeed where I was going, literally. And in the spring of 1998, that changed entirely when I lost my sight through detached retinas. And in a moment, I was no longer involved in university life. I didn't think that I was gonna be able to do a job that I had aspired to, because I didn't think blind people did any of those types of jobs, and I was wrong. And I was no longer involved with my crew. I not only lost my 
sight that day, but I also lost my identity as defined by the things that I was doing. And I felt like I was going to have to sit on the sidelines as a spectator. I, I did what you might expect. I got the white stick and I got a guide dog or seeing eye dog called Larry, um, guide dog of the year in the UK in 2007. Uh, <laughs> Acknowledging the team. Yeah, he's, de he's dead now, but I feel like I need to, you know, speak on his behalf. Anyway, uh, and I got a talking computer that reads everything back to me and a talking phone, giving me access to information, mobility and information. I got a job, I went back studying for a master's in business studies, but it was being out there racing. That's what I missed. And my desire to compete conspired to get me back in a boat. I went on to row internationally again, which isn't that big a deal for a blind person, because when you're in the boat, you're going backwards anyway. Um, <laughs> but I then uh, still carried on as, and switched to adventure racing. And I was racing in deserts, mountains, oceans, all over the world. And it wasn't until the 10th anniversary of losing my sight that an opportunity arose to compete at a level that I'd aspired to before going blind, the equivalent of my Olympic Games. And it came in the form of a 43-day expedition race in the coldest, most remote, most challenging place on Earth in Antarctica. The first race to the South Pole since Shackleton, Scott, and Amundsen set foot in that frozen desert 100 years before. And to do it, I was going to have to drag sledges on cross-country skis across crevasse fields for up to 16 hours a day with my teammates. We'd be racing against Norwegian Special Forces and ex-British Royal Marines people who had raced to the North Pole previously, and after a 1,000 kilometers at temperatures as low as minus 50, I had a chance of reaching the South Pole. I simply had to be part of it. And me wanting to be part of it didn't mean that I was going to be. I had to get my race entry accepted with the organizer, a formidable character called uh, Tony Martin. He's an ex-British Royal Marine, and I imagine that he He's kind of standing aggressively at all stages. Now, I've never seen him, but I think, you know, <laughs> he's standing there. And certainly whenever I was on the phone to him, he was breathing aggressively. And, um, <laughs> and I said to him, look, Tony, I want to do your South Pole race. I've, I've done six marathons in a week in the Gobi Desert. I've done the North Pole Marathon, the Everest Marathon, the Dead Sea Ultra, the Zurich Ironman. I was really, you know, trying to impress him. And he was just going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And before he put the phone down, I said, look, Tony, I appreciate if you've got to check with your health and safety guys, it's, it's just I'm also blind. And quick as a flash, he said, mate, I'll not be coming down a crevasse to get you whether you're blind or not. So uh, if you give me $150,000 and find two teammates to go with you, you're more than welcome. And uh, with those glowing terms and conditions, I immediately signed up. Uh, and I committed, I figured I had the idea, so I, sh I better get the money. Um, so my main concern, apart from the money, was finding people who would be willing to essentially take me there. And I turned to a guy called Simon O'Donnell, a uh, physical and psychological hulk of a man with a big red beard and shaggy hair from Ireland. And we started training together, doing interval training on ski machines, doing chin-ups and press-ups and handstand press-ups in the gym, which, if you ever go to Antarctica, um, there's no particular requirement to be able to do a handstand press-up, <laughs> but it certainly made the cut for the documentary. Um, and we were training to avoid injury, trying to get fit and strong, dragging tires for 12 and 14 hours on the beaches and in the mountains in, in Ireland to model what it would be like to pull the sledges. And after six months of training, Simon and I working together, me with an idea and a commitment to get the money, Simon with the look, and the physical attributes to get us there. Um, neither of us had any particular expertise, so we figured we'd better get a third teammate who knew what they were doing. Um, so we flew to Norway. Remember, the Norwegians got there first 100 years ago with Roald Amundsen. And we linked up with a guy called Inga Solheim, who didn't join our team initially until we proved ourselves over long training weekends, learning how to cross-country ski, learning the skills to survive and race at sub-zero temperatures. And after a further six months of training, he, I would say, he nearly reluctantly joined our team. Um, and together, we formed that functioning team, left Ireland via London to Cape Town, and eventually, under a departure board marked Antarctica, 
to fly to the edge of that frozen continent where we would start with the five other teams to race to the South Pole. And to show you what it was like, rather than tell you, I've got this short video, so let's play the video, please. My main goal with, with this race, I've done quite a lot of adventure races, but I've always felt the reason why people pat me on the back is because I've done these things when I'm blind. I think this race is, regardless of the blindness, this race is challenging on its own. And I wanted to come and do something that was really inspiring, regardless of the blindness. nearly one o'clock in the morning and we're about to start our final 46 kilometers. This race doesn't compare to the things that I've done before. It's been incredibly hard by anyone's standards. It's satisfying all of my ambitions and putting a lot of my blind demons to rest. This week, 10 years ago, I hadn't been out of the house by myself for, for nine months. I was just about to make my first independent journey uh, in Dublin. Little did I know that it would end up finishing at the, at the South Pole 10 years on. It's just been an incredible adventure. I really feel like I can stand up in front of people now and say, I am an adventurer. Well done, enjoy it. Much better to see you. <laughs> that's the silver ball. Oh. That's the silver ball and that's the post that it stood on. Brilliant. Brilliant. Didn't well done, mate. Right. Thanks, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's very kind of you. I sort of feel like sometimes showing that video kind of force you to clap like that. But, uh, <laughs> and, and others, of course, may be wondering why is he showing us his holiday footage from 2009. Um, and of course, the purpose of the exercise for any speaker is not simply to indulge themselves in telling their own story, but rather, hopefully, to have you think about some of the decisions that you make. And for me, it took 10 years to go from that moment where a challenge chose me in terms of blindness, where I felt like I was gonna to have to sit on the sidelines looking on, talking about it, looking backwards, focusing on the problem. And over those 10 years in the race to the South Pole, I was able to prove to myself that I could indeed step into the arena, that I could be a competitor again, pursuing success in the knowledge that I may fail. And of course, we can only do that. We can only take a risk on failure and find that success if we define ourselves by our willingness to try, if we are indeed in the arena. And that's what I mean by being a competitor, not I must win and you must lose, or you must win and I must lose, but rather that we're in the arena pursuing success and risking failure. And just when I thought I had it all neatly packaged up, that that was the choice only to be a spectator or be a competitor, when I felt unstoppable coming back from the South Pole, it was at that point a year later that I fell out of that third story window and hit the concrete below. Which brings me to the second decision, and that is whether we decide to be soloists or collaborators. I found myself in hospital uh, in England where I had my accident, although I'm from Ireland. And over the 16 months in hospital, I discovered that spinal cord injury strikes at the very heart of what it means to be human. It turned me from my upright running cross-country skiing form into this seated compromise of myself. And it's not just the lack of feeling and movement. It also interferes with the body's internal systems that are designed to keep us alive. Nerve pain, 
spasms, time in hospital, shortened lifespans. All these things exhaust even the most well-supported and determined of the 60 million people around the world who suffer from some kind of paralysis. I am fortunate to be one of those well-supported people and with the right support, it is manageable. But what I found particularly strange was that up to this point in history, it had proven to be impossible to find a cure. Yet, history is filled with accounts of the impossible made possible through human endeavor. The kind of human endeavor that took those polar explorers to the South Pole at the start of the last century. And the kind of human endeavor that's gonna take a new wave of explorers to Mars in the middle part of this century. So, inspired by those stories of exploration, I started asking myself, well, why can't that same human endeavor cure paralysis in our lifetime? And based on some of the people that we got to know and that we now work with, I believe that it can. In particular, I just wanna mention two groups, and that is a group of robotics engineers who were building wearable robots, exoskeletons, at a company called Exobionics in San Francisco and a group at UCLA led by a visionary scientist called Reggie Edgerton, who were developing electrical stimulation of the spinal cord to allow for voluntary movement. And I know that's a little bit abstract as I just say the words, so again, to give you a little insight into what that looks like, I got this short video and then I'll explain why I'm telling you this story at all. So let's play the video, please. I don't want to be stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. The goal is to try and walk. Go. If I lay in bed or just sat in my wheelchair, I would be, I'd be giving, giving up completely. I know that the fitter and stronger I can get, the more chance there is that I will be successful to trial a set of robotic legs. Good to be back. Okay, one, two, three. Hey. Whoa. <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, really, really. How's walking? Really great, great, yeah. Definitely. We need a bigger room. <laughs> The mission now is to connect physical exercise guys, the technology and robotics people, and the scientists. Uh, how are you doing? Great to see you. Good to see you. Go, 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 go. Good, good. Oh, yeah, good, yeah, good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, Mark. Go on. Go, 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 go. Wow. <laughs> well done. Good. It's really exciting. It's ridiculous. It is it, really. The exciting thing was that we did find lots of world-class competitors, Exobionics, UCLA, and many other research groups around the world, loads and loads of world-class competitors. What we didn't find was much evidence of collaboration. And that's not exactly a criticism, but it seems to be a fact. When people are really, really good at what they do, they get so focused on their part of the jigsaw that they don't have time or perhaps aren't inclined to look sideways, to look up and see what they might be able to do better together. And as generalists, myself, and I think I can hear my partner Simon uh, over here, as generalists with our only qualification that we entered this world of spinal cord injury and paralysis by virtue of the fact I fell out the window and had a set of paralyzed legs. It seemed to be our job, or at least where we could contribute by bringing those technologies together. So back in 2014, we moved to Los Angeles for three months and every morning, the scientists put electrodes onto the skin of my lower back while I stood in the robot 
and for the first time since I was paralyzed, I could feel my legs beneath me. Not like I used to, but with the stimulator turned on, they felt substantial. I could feel the meat of the muscles around the bones in my legs. And as I walked, as I did more and more with my muscles and my legs, the robot did less and less with its motors and its legs. My heart rate started to hit 150 beats a minute. The muscles started to rebuild themselves. And Simon started to describe it like the moment when Iron Man plugs the mini arc reactor into his chest. <laughs> now, I'm still sitting down here, and uh, we're not fixed. But we are exploring the intersection where humans and technology collide with robotics, brain machine interfaces, electrical stimulation of the spinal cord. And we've created and catalyzed collaborations that are now worth over $100 million. Now, I think back to those stories of exploration in the heroic age of geographical exploration. And despite the personalities involved, the Shackletons, Scotts, and Amundsons, there were no individual hero stories. It was always about people working together to achieve more. And when we look at our work to cure paralysis in our lifetime, it's very, very clear that no individual scientist or technologist or ultra high net worth individual or patient advocate is going to cure it on their own. It's going to be about people working together to achieve more. So we can be brilliant, world class, as soloists and do OK. But for the big breakthroughs, we've got to find a way to get those people working together to achieve more. And I'm going to ask you to enter my world of blindness for a moment for the final 30 seconds and get you to close your eyes and think about yourselves with your eyes closed. At the beginning, I said that sometimes we have the luxury of choosing our challenges and sometimes challenges choose us. What we decide to do about it, that's what counts. I think it's important that we have world-class competitors pursuing success and risking failure. But I think it's when we get competitors finding a way to work together as collaborators, that's where we make the big breakthroughs. Thank you.